The sun filtered through the curtains, its warmth mocking the chill that had seeped into my bones. I awoke to an eerie silence, the kind that gnaws at your insides, whispering that something is terribly wrong. Sophie's crib was empty. Heart pounding, I scrambled out of bed and rushed down the hallway, my bare feet slapping against the hardwood floor. Jonah? I called out, dreading the silence that answered. I found our weak old daughter alone in her nursery, slumbering peacefully. But where was my husband? Panic gripped me as I checked room after room, my voice growing more shrill with each unanswered call of his name. It was then that I noticed the kitchen light bleeding through the crack of the partially open door. With lidden steps, I made my way in, terrified of what I might find. Nothing could have prepared me for the sight that awaited, the pristine marble countertop undisturbed, save for Jonah's laptop lying open and askew. Its haunting glow beckoned me closer, and I felt the earth shift beneath my feet as my eyes settled upon the ominous words seared into the screen. My darling Eloise. Those three words, spoken so tenderly in my husband's voice, now seemed like a cruel mockery as I read on in disbelief. With each line, what I thought I knew about my life crumbled like a condemned building. By the time you read this, I will be gone. My knees buckled as the truth slammed into me. Jonah was dead, by his own hand, the letter professed. He claimed to have taken his life, racked with guilt, over unforgivable sins he could no longer outrun. I've drained our accounts, my love. It's the least I could do to spare you from the fallout. I crumpled to the floor, hot tears streaming down my cheeks as his barefaced deceit washed over me in waves. How could the man I had loved, the father of my child, do this to us? I'm so sorry, Eloise. You deserved better. His voice reverberated through my mind, each remorseful utterance a searing blade to my heart. Questions piled upon themselves in dizzying succession. What unforgivable sins, what fallout. Bitter bile rose in my throat as my gaze fell upon the bank statement strewn about the counter, confirming his admission of draining our life savings. In that moment, the world as I knew it ceased to exist. My husband was gone, our future shattered, our tiny family's life upended by his selfish final act. I was left to pick up the shards of the life he'd so callously discarded, a newly minted single mother with no means to provide, no way to escape the cavernous pit of despair rapidly consuming me. As little Sophie's cries echoed from the nursery, I wrapped my arms around myself, rocking back and forth in a futile attempt at comfort. What cruel betrayal would drive a man to such depths? And how could I forge ahead, guiding our daughter through the devastation her father had wrought? The only thing more harrowing than the deafening silence was the unyielding tempest that awaited, a maelstrom of unanswered questions, shaken to the core by the echo of a thousand lies. The days and weeks after Jonah's alleged suicide blurred together in a haze of sleepless nights and endless tears. I went through the motions like an automaton, my every waking moment consumed by the immense task of caring for Sophie alone, while the guilt-ridden words in Jonah's email loop echoed endlessly in my mind. "'It's all my fault,' I would whisper, rocking my restless infant in the predawn hours. "'I should have seen the signs.' Clara was my sole lifeline during those turbulent times, dropping off meals, helping around the house, and lending an ear whenever the weight of my shattered reality crushed me anew. My childhood friend's caring presence was a salve, but it could not dull the incessant ache for answers that plagued me. There has to be more to this, I told Clara one evening as she swayed with Sophie on the porch swing. Suicide? Draining our accounts? It doesn't add up. She squeezed my hand, her face etched with worry. The police say there's no evidence of foul play. And the money. I know what they say. My words sliced the air like a whip, startling Sophie. I drew a steadying breath. I'm sorry. I just... I can't accept that he's really gone, that he would do this to his family. Over the weeks, despite the lack of evidence, that kernel of doubt bloomed into obsession. I spent every spare moment, however fleeting, devouring the Internet for any shred of information, real or fabricated, about spousal deceits or faked deaths. It was on one such late-night binge, my laptop's glow casting hard shadows across my face, that a private message arrived from an anonymous source. Your husband is alive. I sucked in a harsh breath at those three words, my hands trembling against the keys. I have proof 
the message continued, but it'll cost you. I fired back a response with fierce indignation. How dare you try to make money off my suffering? Just being cautious, they replied without delay. Let's meet. The arrangements were made with suspicious ease, like my mystery contact was prepared for my righteous anger. We convened two nights later at a nondescript cafe across town, Clara insisting on accompanying me for safety. A nondescript burlap sack sat before us on the table. What is that? I asked the hunched figure obscured by a hoodie as they took the seat opposite me. With a gloved hand, they grasped the sack's opening and upended it. My heart froze as documents and grainy photo stills spilled out into view, images of Jonah, very much alive, embracing a faceless woman on what appeared to be a tropical beach. You were right not to lose hope, the contact murmured, sliding a burner phone across the table. He's alive, and he's been very naughty. Hot tears stung my eyes as I studied the unmistakable evidence. It was like a dam had burst within me, the despairing anguish of these last few months surging forth as bitter resentment and crippling rage. Jonah was alive. He had willingly forsaken his wife and newborn child, that cruel, selfish bastard. My fingers tightened around the burner phone until the plastic bit into my flesh. As impossible as it seemed, this incriminating bounty was the answer to the questions that had haunted me. No longer would I be an unwitting accomplice in my own deception. Justice would be mine, no matter how steep the price. With the damning evidence clutched in my hands, a curious detachment settled over me like a shroud. It was as if I was watching myself from outside my body, a woman scorned, yet fortified by a singular determination to make the deceitful man who had callously discarded his family answer for his transgressions. Let me get this straight, Clara said slowly, cradling a sleeping Sophie as we poured over the documents back at my place. Jonah faked his death? drained your savings, and is now living it up with some mistress on a beach somewhere? I nodded tightly, sifting through the photo stills that burned like smoldering coals in my hands. Exactly. And that's just the tip of the iceberg from what this source claims. Please tell me you're not considering doing business with these people, Clara implored, shaking her head. Getting mixed up with shady characters never ends well. I don't have a choice, I shot back, startling Sophie with the sharpness of my tone. Sorry, honey. Drawing a calming breath, I continued in a measured cadence. Look at these photos, Clara, at the life he's leading while I've been drowning in misery. He deserves to be exposed for the lying snake he is. And he will be, she said, placing a hand on my arm. But not like this. There has to be another way that doesn't involve God knows what risks. I regarded my friend, taking in the concern etched in the creases around her eyes. She was right. Getting tangled up in whatever web the anonymous source was spinning could only lead to further tragedy. But what option did I have to disrupt Jonah's newly crafted paradise? My finger hovered over the burner's call button. You're too good a person to go down that road, Clara murmured. Don't let his lies drag you into an abyss you can't claw your way out of. In that moment, it was as if a veil had been lifted from my eyes. I was allowing Jonah's betrayal to fester into an all-consuming obsession, poisoning my very spirit with bitterness and rash judgments. Clara was my anchor, the tether pulling me back from the brink of self-destruction. I dropped the phone, features softening as I drank in the sweet scent of Sophie's tussled hair. "'You're right,' I said at last. Rushing into the unknown would only lead to chaos. There has to be another way. Over the next few days, I made it my mission to reconstruct the identity of the new man Jonah had seemingly become. Between internet searches and poring over public records, a clearer picture began to emerge. Jonah Parker was likely an assumed alias, his true name unknown. His current place of residence was a small town in the Florida panhandle called Willow Creek. He was now going by the name Jake Hutchins and posing as a wealthy philanthropist investing in revitalization projects. His companion in the photos was never clearly identified. Each new detail filled me with a reinvigorating sense of purpose. Carefully, I began crafting a trail of evidence and unanswered questions. Handheld threads that would hopefully unravel the entire tapestry of lies my husband had skillfully woven around his life. No more would I be kept in the shadows, stumbling blindly for the truth. I would be Jonah's judge and jury, hauling him by force into the light he had so callously turned his back on. 
Justice, deliverance, revenge, they were all within my grasp now. I need only maintain an unwavering focus and seize it. You can't be serious. Clara gaped at me from across the dinette table. Willow Creek? That's like a twelve-hour drive. I shrugged, continuing to stuff clothes into my duffel bag. So we'll make it an overnight trip. I've already booked a room. Eloise, stop! She reached across and grabbed my wrist. Just listen to yourself for a minute. You're talking about tracking down your lying scumbag husband in some random Florida town based on a bunch of grainy photos from God knows where. Her shaking free of her grasp, I zipped up the bag with more force than necessary. It's not just the photos, Clara. I've been poring over public records, following money trails, assumed aliases. All of it leads to this Jake Hutchins living it up in Willow Creek on my family's stolen finances. And you honestly think marching in there half-cocked and confronting him is a good idea? She cried, throwing up her hands. He's clearly a skilled con man who has had plenty of practice covering his tracks. What if he bolts or lashes out? Then I'll be ready, I stated flatly, pulling my mother's antique pistol from my nightstand drawer. Clara's eyes widened in shock as I slipped it into my purse. I didn't get this far by being careless. Jesus, Eloise, she whispered, cradling Sophie protectively. I really think you need to reevaluate what you're doing. This isn't you. My steely gaze met hers unflinchingly. Isn't it, though? That snake made me into this person. Someone who can't even trust her own husband. Well, the gloves are off now. He deserves to feel my wrath. There was a heavy silence as we stared each other down, the weight of the situation pressing in all around us. This wasn't just about finding some cold, hard evidence of Jonah's deception. This had become a personal quest for vengeance, no matter how ill-advised it might be. At last, Clara spoke in a measured tone. Fine. I can't stop you from going, clearly. But I'm coming with you. No, absolutely not, I shook my head adamantly. It's too dangerous. I need you here with Sophie. Like hell I'm staying behind, she shot back, fire in her eyes. I'm not letting you run headfirst into an unstable situation with that sicko alone. I opened my mouth to protest further, but something in her expression gave me pause. This wasn't just about me and the choices I was making. It was about our enduring friendship, the bond we had forged over countless shared struggles throughout our lives. If our roles were reversed, could I simply stand idly by while Clara put herself in harm's way? Drawing a deep, shuddering breath, I gave a resigned nod. Okay. But we play this my way, understand? No heroics. You've got it, chief, she cracked a thin smile, pulling me into a fierce embrace. That bastard's not going to know what hit him. The drive to Willow Creek passed in tense silence, both of us processing the tumultuous events that had brought us to this point. No matter how this played out, there would be no turning back. Confronting Jonah meant unleashing a maelstrom that could potentially devastate what little remained of our lives. Yet as the endless highways finally gave way to the sleepy roads of Willow Creek's sun-dappled outskirts, I felt that raging inner storm swell within me. Somewhere in this picturesque little town, my husband was living a life of supreme comfort and ease at my expense, no longer. We pulled up in front of Jonah's listed address, an immaculate colonial-style mansion surrounded by lush gardens and fountains, the very embodiment of everything that should have been mine. This is it, I murmured, hands clenching spasmodically around the pistol's grip. Clara squeezed my shoulder reassuringly. I've got your back. Let's bring this scumbag down. In that moment, the feelings of uncertainty and self-doubt slipped away like a discarded second skin. This wasn't just about getting answers anymore. It was about vengeance, pure and simple. It was time for Jonah Parker to atone for the sins he had committed against me. The grounds surrounding Jonah's opulent estate were deathly quiet as Clara and I approached, our footfalls seeming to echo unnaturally against the stillness. I felt a sudden pang of uncertainty, the weight of the pistol pressing against my side like a lead weight. You sure about this? Clara whispered, eyeing the sprawling property warily. We could still turn back. I shook my head, marshalling my resolve. No way. We've come too far to back down now. Skirting carefully along the perimeter path, we searched for any sign of staff or security, Prisutsvia. The place seemed deserted, almost unnaturally so for a home of this grandeur. A painted ceramic fountain gurgled faintly up ahead, 
and I instinctively slowed our pace, ears straining. That's when the voices reached us, distant but distinct. Really doing a number on this town, Mr. Hutchins. We're damn lucky to have an investor like you. Please call me Jake. My husband's unmistakable baritone made my blood run cold. And Willow Creek's revival is just the start. There are plenty of other small-town communities crying out for the kind of revitalization only someone like me can provide. Clara shot me a questioning glance, but I simply motioned her onward. My jaw clenched in grim determination. We followed the voices around a boxwood hedge to find a small courtyard centered around a terraced garden. There sat Jake Hutchins, resplendent in an ivory linen suit as he held court with a small cadre of what appeared to be local businessmen. You're too modest, Jake, one of the men simpered. What you've accomplished here is nothing short of a miraculous. Why, Willow Creek was on its last legs before you showed up. Yes, well, I simply have a knack for separating the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, Jonah remarked with an arrogant tilt of his head. Towns like this are ripe for the kind of creative investment strategies I employ. Hey, whatever you're doing, don't stop! Another sycophant gushed with a sloppy laugh. In fact, we were hoping to pick that big brain of yours about expansion opportunities. Revulsion twisted my insides into knots as I watched the display. Creative investment strategies? More like a talent for deception, lying through his teeth as he swindled these poor people blind, just like he'd done to me and Sophie. In that moment, I knew words would never be enough. Only decisive action could cut through the vile web of manipulation Jonah had spun around himself. Without a second thought, I thrust the pistol into Clara's hands. Cover me. I muttered through gritted teeth before striding out into the open air of the courtyard. Thought you could outrun your past forever, didn't you? Jake? The effect was like a bucket of ice water being dumped on the proceedings. Jonah's glass tumbler shattered on the stone pavers as the color drained from his face. Eloise, he stammered, springing to his feet. What? What are you doing here? Looking for my lying snake of a husband. That's what! I spat back, taking a few more steps forward, as Clara emerged from the hedges, weapon leveled. Or should I call you Jake now? The gathered men looked on in stunned silence as the two of us faced off mere feet from where Jonah stood, rooted in place. How? He swallowed hard. How did you find me? Did you really think you could fake your own death, drain our accounts, and start playing make-believe philanthropist without me sniffing you out eventually? I ground out, fists clenching at my sides as fury boiled over. You seem to have forgotten that I'm not some brainless trophy wife who'd sit idly by while you destroyed our family. Now just take it easy, Eloise, Jonah stammered, hands raised in a placating gesture as he eyed the pistol. Whatever you think is going on here, I can explain. Save it, you pathetic lying weasel. I raged, taking another purposeful step forward as furious tears blurred my vision. I have evidence of everything, the fake identities, the money trails, even photos of you carrying on with some mistress. Your life of comfort ends now. There was a deafening silence in those next few moments, as if the whole courtyard had been struck dumb. I drank in Jonah's pallid, unsure expression with dark satisfaction. The game was up. His betrayal and vast deceptions had finally caught up with him, and there would be no more running. A harsh laugh broke free from him as he seemed to regain his composure. Wow, I have to hand it to you, dear wife. You've officially taken the crazy train all the way to Bonkerville. My grip tightened impotently on thin air, a muscle working furiously in my clenched jaw. If you think waving around some circumstantial evidence is going to take me down, you're sadly miss— the deafening report of the pistol's firing drowned out his spiteful words, punching into the decorative tilework at his feet with an echoing crack. Ceramic shards blasted outward as Jonah leapt backwards with a strangled cry of shock and fear. The next one's not a warning shot, I hissed, snatching the still-smoking weapon from Clara's hands. You lying, thieving son of a bitch! At long last the veil had truly lifted, and the reckoning I'd been craving was finally at hand. Jonah's face drained of all color as the gunshot's echo still rang in the courtyard. His eyes were wild, flickering between me and the smoldering hole in the tilework by his feet. You're insane, he sputtered, stumbling backwards a few paces, completely off your rocker. 
one of the gathered men, a pot-bellied fellow in an ill-fitting suit, cautiously took a step forward with hands raised in a placating gesture. Now, now, let's all just take a deep breath here. The pistol swung towards him, stopping him in his tracks. This doesn't involve you, Tubby. Unless you want your fancy loafers reupholstered, I suggest you back that ass up. He quickly retreated, mumbling assurances as the other men cowered in silence. All eyes were locked on the barrel now aimed squarely at Jonah's chest. Eloise, please, he began shakily. We can work this out like rational. Don't even start with that crap, I spat. After everything you've put me and Sophie through, all the lies, the betrayal, the mind games, there's no working it out to be done here. Is that what this is about? The money? A flicker of his trademark arrogance flashed across his features. Name a price, any price, and it's yours. Just, just put the gun down and we can talk like civilized people. I let out a harsh bark of laughter. You delusional prick, like buying me off could even begin to make up for the hell you've put us through, the sheer audacity. My grip tightened on the pistol as resentment boiled over. You were my whole world, Jonah. The man I loved more than life itself. I would have given anything for you. Furious tears blurred my vision as all the anguish and torment of these past months came rushing to the surface in waves of white-hot fury. Was any of it real? I choked out, voice cracking with emotion. Or was our entire marriage just another long con in your book? For a few heartbeats, Jonah seemed to wilt under my words, something almost resembling genuine remorse flickering behind those cold eyes. Just as quickly, the mask slammed back into place, hardening his expression into an imperious sneer. "'You're right. You deserve the truth,' he said coolly, straightening his shoulders. "'Our marriage was never anything more than a means to an end. You were a pliable, well-bred piece of arm candy to help grease the wheels while I built my business empire.' My knuckles went white around the pistol's grip. "'And sweet, naive Sophie,' he continued with a contemptuous sneer, just another disposable, loose end to be discarded once her usefulness ran out. A shocked murmur ran through the assembled men, but it was drowned out by the pounding of blood in my ears. He was taunting me now, taking smug satisfaction in stripping away any lingering sentimentality to expose the harsh reality, that the man I loved never truly existed. It was all an elaborate facade, a masquerade designed to allow this sociopath to slither in plain sight and take everything that should have been ours. Something snapped inside me in that moment, something primal and unstoppable. I would not let this hollow, manipulative shell continue to belittle and degrade everything I held dear. You repulsive, subhuman worm, I growled through gritted teeth. For once in your pathetic life, you're going to face the consequences of your actions. Eloise, no, Clara cried in warning, but it was too late. With a guttural scream of rage tearing from my throat, I leveled the pistol at center mass and started squeezing the trigger. Jonah's eyes went wide with panic as he flung himself sideways, the first deafening report blasting a chunk from a nearby decorative urn. The chain of fire continued unabated, round after round shattering stone and bark in an ever-tightening spiral around my husband's scrambling form. Clouds of debris filled the air as primal bloodlust narrowed my vision to a visceral, singular need to make this lying, reprehensible monster hurt as he had hurt me. Suddenly two powerful arms wrapped around me from behind, wrenching the pistol from my grasp as a muffled voice yelled in my ear, Eloise! Stop! You're gonna kill him! Clara's panicked eyes swam into focus as the weapon clattered uselessly to the ground. I blinked owlishly, the adrenaline dissipating as shuddering breaths rattled through my frame. Looking around, I saw the courtyard had been utterly demolished in my rampage, craters and gouges from the barrage painting a path that led right to. Jonah curled into a fetal whimper against the far wall. A soft keening sound escaped my lips as the enormity of what I had nearly done washed over me in waves. Violent tremors shook my body as I collapsed backwards into Clara's arms, all the anger and hatred seemingly spent at last. I was vaguely aware of raised voices and footsteps approaching, but I couldn't bring myself to focus. The pistol had been a line too far, the culmination of everything this man had driven me to become, a hollow, hateful shell of my former self, hell-bent on vengeance at any cost. As hands seized me and a cacophony of shouts rang out all around, 
only one muted, familiar timber seemed to rise above the din. Well, shit, she really did take the crazy train all the way to Bonkerville. The courtroom was eerily silent as I took the stand, the weight of a hundred expectant stares pressing down on me from all sides. My hands were trembling, throat constricted, as I raised my right hand to sworn an oath most people never have cause to utter. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. I drew in a shuddering breath. I do. The prosecutor, an impeccably dressed woman somewhere in her fifties, offered an encouraging nod before rising to her feet. Mrs. Parker, please recount for the court the events of March 22nd that precipitated these proceedings. I glanced towards the defense table, where Jonah sat ramrod straight, face impassive, but eyes glittering with poorly concealed resentment. Our eyes met for the briefest moment before I quickly looked away, the old anger and hurt still simmering too close to the surface. It was early evening when my friend Clara and I arrived in Willow Creek, I began, keeping my tone measured despite the thundering of my pulse. We had suspicions that my husband might be residing there under an assumed identity after faking his own death some months prior. Objection! Jonah's attorney, an oily-looking man in a $10,000 suit, shot to his feet, moved to strike that highly speculative claim from the record. The judge fixed me with a steely look. Mrs. Parker, please stick to the facts as you directly perceive them. I nodded tightly. We discovered Jonah, going by the alias Jake Hutchins, at a residence on the outskirts of town. He was hosting a small gathering, presenting himself as some kind of wealthy investor. From there, the testimony seemed to unspool of its own accord, each rattling memory dredging up the turmoil and anguish of those fateful events. I spoke of the confrontation, Jonah's admission of deception and swindling, the violent outburst that nearly took his life. He provoked me, I said, swallowing hard around the lump in my throat. He made light of the pain and damage his lies had caused, how disposable our family was to his grand vision. And something inside me just... snapped. There were a few agonizing moments of stillness as I gathered my composure. I'm not excusing what I did, the property damage, threatening him at gunpoint. I drew a ragged breath, forcing myself to maintain eye contact with the scrutinizing jurors. But you have to understand the mental and emotional anguish he put me through, thinking I'd lost the man I loved forever. A hushed murmuring rippled through the gallery, but the prosecutor pressed on undeterred. Thank you for your candor, Mrs. Parker. Now, regarding the evidence you and Miss Hudson collected that led you to Willow Creek in the first place— she proceeded to enter each damning photo, document, and record into evidence, a veritable highlight reel of Jonah's stunning duplicity laid bare for all to see. As I sat there numbly watching the well-rehearsed theatrics play out, the realization finally struck me that this was it, the grand unraveling of his meticulously crafted fiction. The artful facade of Jake Hutchins and his benevolent investments was shredded beyond repair exposing the true rotted core that lay beneath. Bank statements tracked the stolen money trails, public records outlined his forged identities, and testimonies from former business partners wove a tapestry of double dealings and deceptions spanning decades. Jonah sat motionless through it all, refusing to meet my gaze, even as the walls closed inexorably inward around him. Gone was the arrogant showman of our confrontation, the slick-tongued manipulator well-practiced in evasion and denial. This smaller, bent creature in the ill-fitted suit seemed to shrivel under the scrutiny, a hollow remnant of the man who had once so thoroughly shattered my world. By the time the final piece of evidence was submitted, security footage capturing our melee in the courtyard that day, a palpable tension hung over the proceedings. All parties understood this was the climactic culmination the grand finale of Jonah's unmasking as the conniving, morally bankrupt charlatan he truly was. Hateful glares bore down on him from all angles as the grainy video played out, each gunshot's staccato report sending faint tremors through the room. The clips reached their crescendo with my scream of primal fury echoing off the walls, jurors flinching as that hateful barrage laid waste to the picturesque backdrop. As eerie stillness descended once more, Jonah raised his haggard face towards the ceiling with a self-deprecating smirk, muttering two words with a rueful shake of his head. 
well played. Some might have mistaken his muttering for an admittance of defeat at last, but as his hollow gaze swiveled to find mine across that vast divide, I recognized the truth glistening behind those obsidian depths, a dark promise that despite this reckoning, our battle was only just beginning. Five years later, Mom, hurry up! We're going to be late for the ribbon cutting. Sophie's exuberant voice echoed down the hall of our modest home, stirring me from my reverie. Blinking slowly, I turned away from the window and its view of the newly renovated community center across the street. I'm coming, sweetheart, I called out, grabbing my light jacket and purse. Sophie met me in the front room, practically vibrating with excitement in her crisp blue sundress. Can you believe it's finally happening? She gushed, eyes shining. After all this time, all your hard work, I smiled wistfully, brushing an errant lock of hair from her forehead. My little girl was growing up so fast, her bright spirit and unwavering compassion an endless source of pride and inspiration. It took a village, that's for sure, I murmured, tugging her into a warm embrace. But you're right. Seeing the center open its doors is the dream realized at last. Pulling back, I studied her animated features, so full of hope and an infectious enthusiasm for life. The years had hardened me in many ways, stripping away the naivete that once made me such a hapless victim of betrayal and deceit. But thanks to Sophie's light, I had been able to maintain my conviction through the darkest of times, long after the trial and headlines faded from memory. It was little over a year after Jonah received his forty-year sentence that the first compensation payout came through, court-mandated restitution funded by liquidating his ill-gotten assets. I had been adamant from the outset that every cent would go towards creating something positive from the rubble of our shattered lives. And so the Willow Creek Community Enrichment Center was born. My original vision was modest, a small soup kitchen and counseling services for struggling families in the area. But as donations and volunteers steadily poured in over the years, all fueled by the incendiary flames of Jonah's trial, the center blossomed into something far more vibrant and impactful. Now the fully renovated and modernized complex stood as a beacon of hope and fellowship, complete with classrooms for job training skills development, state-of-the-art counseling services, therapy, addiction programs, domestic abuse support, community gardens and urban farming co-op, child care and educational programs, social services and housing assistance. It had become a true force for positive change, a living rebuke to the insidious poison Jonah sought to sow in this community and countless others through his tangled web of lies and exploitation. And it was all built on the unwavering support and tireless work of those who refused to let his sins define them. As Sophie and I stepped outside into the brilliant spring morning, we were greeted by the hustle and bustle of the center's grand opening preparation. A large crowd was already gathered, with news vans and well-wishers steadily streaming in. Clara waved us over, her own daughter Emily in tow, as they finished setting out the ceremonial first-cut ribbons. "'There you two are!' Clara exclaimed with a radiant grin. "'Was starting to think you'd sleep through your own victory lap. "'You know me, never one to seek the spotlight,' I quipped back with an easy smile." A comfortable silence fell between us, the culmination of a shared journey stretching back decades filling the air. "'I never could have done this without you, you know,' I said at last. Clara scoffed lightly. "'Yeah. Right. Like I was the one who put her entire life on the line to stop that psychopath and make something good come from the wreckage.' I opened my mouth to counter, but she raised a hand to halt me. "'But who's counting, right?' her expression turned serious. "'The point is—' Today we celebrate not just bricks and programming, but everything this place represents. Justice. Renewal. Not being afraid to fight for what's right, no matter how badly the odds are stacked against you. A familiar lump rose in my throat as I regarded my dearest friend, my sister in all but blood. Clara, who had seen me through the very depths of despair, and was now here to bask in this hard-won triumph. To growth, I managed at last, pulling her into a fierce embrace and the pursuit of purpose, no matter how high the cost. Here, here, she murmured thickly against my shoulder. As we separated, the opening remarks began over the PA system. A bright new chapter was beginning with the snip of those ribbons, 
one of community and redemption rising gloriously from the smoldering ashes of personal tragedy, all thanks to the refusal to ever stop raging against the darkness.